Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ducks Confidential Podcast. I'm James Kreppi, as always, uh, joined by Ryan Clark. And we'll get into uh, a few things here as the Ducks are basically in the midst of uh, fall camp, along with everybody else around the country. But uh, as we enter the third calendar week, the second full week in and of itself of practice, the second full week of uh, full padded practice for that matter, or or at least where some of the practices are full pads. Uh, So a little bit more to discern after the first scrimmage. We'll get into that a little bit, but we'll start uh, with what, uh, look, it draws attention. They don't, you know, you don't get awards for these things. Uh, Nobody really remembers it in retrospect, but they are nevertheless the preseason polls and they are the polls that carry some weight and matter. Uh, Obviously, again, they don't exactly carry all the weight in the world heading into the season. But nevertheless, they are the preseason polls. They are the early litmus test of where things are and where people believe these uh, teams are entering the 2024 season. So with that, uh, Oregon comes in at number three in both the preseason coaches poll and the preseason AP poll. Uh, So with Dan Lanning being one of the voters in the preseason coaches poll and uh, in the AP poll, the variance for the Ducks in terms of the uh, vote uh, dispersal was uh, one voter had them number one. That was uh, Brett McMurphy, formerly of uh, ESPN. And uh, a couple of voters had them at two. The majority and plurality had them at three. Uh, a, the next largest group had them at four. And uh, then at three voters had them at five and one as low as six. So that's kind of your... Uh, Scatter plot, if you will, uh, of the AP voters for the Ducks heading into the season. Uh, very much, like I say, in line with we don't know exactly the breakdown of the preseason coaches other than that they were third and didn't receive a first place vote among the coaches. Not exactly a surprise, but bottom line, a season that we already knew had high expectations and a lot of hype and a lot of uh, billing of individual players and accolades and transfers and NIL and all the things that we've talked about and mentioned before. Uh, very much uh, living up to that in terms of perception from uh, the preseason coaches poll and AP poll, where, like I say, they come in as high as they've been in uh, either going back to 2014 or 2013, depending on which poll we're, we're talking about. So therefore, uh, yeah, for, for the program uh, that is moving into the Big Ten, that, uh, as we all know, has had quite a quarter century or so of uh, success, still has not broken through to that highest of levels in terms of winning a championship. But... Uh, right there with the likes of Georgia, who's number one in both polls, Ohio State, which is number two in both polls. Obviously, it's setting up for, uh, as we all knew, a epic matchup on October 12th that will be the focus, uh, regardless of what happens for both Oregon and Ohio State between now and then. Uh, if you look at the schedules for both teams, it would be hard to assume a loss for either one of them heading into that game. So that could and should be one of the biggest games of the entire season. If we're going to go based on the polls, if not based on recruiting talent, if not based on any number of other factors, that's kind of the lay of the land as we head into the season and where things stand by way of that. And we'll get, you know, obviously you can look at the polls to see who else is ranked and what number and all those kinds of things. But uh, your your view, your perspective, your takeaways from uh, from some of these early polls and numbers there, Ryan. Yeah, I, I think that it's uh, proof positive that you know this this Oregon team is is in the view of of experts in the view of coaches uh, absolutely among the the national championship contenders this year. You think about the last twenty years uh, of the national champions. Pretty much all of them have come out of the preseason top seven. Uh, that's that's of course a, a statement that applies more specifically to uh, to t- to the fact that college football is top heavy. You know these top programs have <laughs> have sort of always been in in this spot, um, but. By by that same token, um, you know it's it's a good sign for Oregon to to give itself a bite out of the apple this year. Uh, it's it's obviously not you know terribly informative in a lot of ways either, um, but interesting in terms of the storylines it does create, like that Ohio State game. Um, of course, you know that, that, that I think that Ohio State and Oregon fans could be forgiven for overlooking the the first few weeks of their season just because they they are thinking constantly about that matchup in Eugene on October 12th um and 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 it's going to be an exciting one 
for sure in terms of the the talent on the field and in terms of the rankings look georgia does not have a a peachy schedule to start the season there is uh, that is a very talented georgia team that may well be undefeated at that point as well but you're talking about the potential for that being a one versus two matchup if Georgia slips up against any number of these, you know, high level teams that they play in those first five weeks. Um, so whether it's two, three or one, two, that's that's obviously the thing you have circled. Uh, obviously, Michigan comes in at number nine. Um, some folks think maybe just by being the reigning national champions alone with all they lost, they the, some folks have, have posited they might be a bit overrated in that spot, but, you know, they got to play the games. And then USC being one of the other Big Ten schools in the top 25, along with Iowa, 20, uh, 25 and 23, respectively. Um Boise State, too. Like, the Idaho game, obviously, uh, folks could also be forgiven for completely overlooking that because that's going to more than likely be a, a significant blowout in favor of the Ducks. Yeah, look, but that Boise State about game is interesting. Polls, Idaho, Idaho is a preseason number seven, I'll have you know, in, in the FCS poll. So, that's you right. know, overlook, overlook at your own peril, all right? We have to, <laughs> you know, come on now. This is a top ten matchup. Ryan, That's don't true. Be, why, why are we overlooking the mighty, uh, <laughs> mighty vandals formerly of the FBS? I mean, yeah, come on. Now. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. That's true. And and the uh, the the top 10 across the two different top 25s. That's that's big. Uh, but that Boise State uh, game, you know, ha- has a little bit of intrigue to it just because you, you look at how they project out the. Um, the college football playoff based on that top 25 rankings. And right now uh, that Boise state game is a preview of what would be a a first round playoff game at Austin stadium again, uh, this time in in the winter. Uh, So, you know, something interesting there out of the polls, but beyond that, really, I mean, it's, it's, it's the preseason hype. It's, uh, it's not necessarily instructive in terms of the, the college football playoff and that those rankings, which are completely dependent upon conference championships and everything else. But man, Oregon there at number three, among all those elite programs, that's got to have fans excited for sure. I think the, if there's anything to be taken away at all um, from a, a really broad and, and wide angle lens look at, uh, at the preseason polls uh, is, look, we, we already knew with realignment that this was a power two and the next two and then everybody else. Like that was, it was already understood. It was clear as crystal. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that the SEC and the Big Ten are going to run everything and the Big 12 and the ACC will be willing, you know, more than willing, uh, that they're going to be welcome to the party under the terms that the other two set and everybody else is just going to have to have to deal. Well, the top nine in the AP poll are either SEC or Big Ten teams or Notre Dame. So... There, you know, you, you, again, you don't have to be a genius uh, to, to realize these things. And if you go even further down, quite frankly, you only have a couple of Big 12 teams in there uh, in general, but especially among the top 15. Um, but you can you can even expand it all the way to the 25. The Big 12 has the next cluster for sure, and the ACC has a few, no doubt. But ultimately, this is this is a two conference system, largely. Yes, the other team, you know, the other conferences will get their champions into the playoff and they'll have champ yes, yes, but in terms of where where the power lies here, which is hardly an epiphany, uh that's something to take. Is <laughs> go t- go take a look at, you know, wh- where 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 are all these schools playing at and what's that competition going to look like? And that's again not to prognosticate about what the polls then become 3 months from now, but more so in the what the competition is going to look like. Why did realignment happen beyond money? Well, yeah, it's to create the bigger matchups where the, all these teams are going to be beaten up on each other on a week-to-week, which is also to say that I'm not saying it's going to happen this year, but in the not-too-distant future, you are absolutely going to have a Big Ten or SEC three-loss, maybe even four-loss team make the playoff and not just make it, I think you're going to have a three-loss SEC or Big Ten team make the playoff and win multiple games, if not a national championship. Yeah, I'm not saying it's going to happen in 2024, but give it time. 
Yeah, people th- time. people and- thought that you know the expanded playoff would. Some people at least thought that the expanded playoff would perhaps you know cool some of the debate regarding selection for for those playoff spots. But in fact, the super conference realignment nature of the situation lends itself to more debate and more situations like the one that you're talking about where like let's say a a three loss michigan team um you know gets into the big 10 championship and beats an oregon or beats beats a uh, an ohio state then you're talking about a a team with an automatic bid a first round by and three losses uh getting into a, a spot like that or in a more likely scenario getting a getting a spot in being one of the higher ranked teams uh among the at large bids so it's <laughs> it's it's what these conferences create right it's a preservation of power it's a preservation of of their standing among their competition because you know the florida states of the world and the clemsons of the world are are going to gripe and moan and and complain uh in these scenarios but you know it it's judgment calls it's it's you know subjective appearance and and so much of this is is rooted in debate and and everything but it, it absolutely um it is merited given given the power of these two conferences now well the auto bid part I mean, that's just going to be the way it goes everywhere so that's neither here nor there i mean ultimately if the if that that could have existed before um you had that with the divisions where whether it was the big 10 west division was weak uh, in the old Big 12, the Big 12 North was weak uh, in certain years. You know, before George's ascent, uh, the SEC East was weaker than the West. So that's that that ebbs and flows, and that's cyclical over time. Uh, and like I say, and if you get into the title game, that there could be some crazy upset. That again, that already existed in even in the old BCS system. Um, so that's neither here nor there. What like? I'm not susp- I'm not saying it can't happen this year, but not for nothing. The Big 12 is billing itself as the deepest conference in the country this year. And I understand that Utah is the preseason favorite and that, you know, Kansas State and Kansas and Arizona are all getting love. The point is, is, well, what if, why, why are we assuming that it has to be the three-loss team from the SEC or the Big 10 that causes controversy? How about if the Big 12 champion is a three-loss team because it just cannibalizes itself much as the old Pac-12 did? Well, when the Pac-12 did it, if a team suffered one loss, they were basically knocked out of the 14 playoff uh, by default, and a second loss was absolute. Well, now we're going to be in a world in an expanded playoff where why are we assuming that you know the Big 12 champs are getting in, but that could be a three-loss team. And then we're going to be debating less about the worthiness of the multi-loss at-large SEC or Big 10 team from one of the most powerful leagues and more about, hey, wait a minute, maybe this auto bid thing doesn't make so much sense. Uh, and that's again, that'll be the next conversation. So that's where I say, like, where, where we'll see, obviously, over the course of time, much as we saw in the 14 playoff, how it shifted the conversation and focus and the like. I think the expanded playoff will will certainly keep things much more interesting, much deeper into the season, keep a lot of teams alive, much deeper into the season uh, and make for a lot of fun and excitement in the sport, probably more than ever before. Uh, but I think some of the discourse around worthiness and selectivity will not just be about at larges. Like I say, I think some of it's going to be about um, whether auto bids should or shouldn't be a thing, whether the conference champions should automatically get the first round by. I think that's going to be something. But fortunately, ESPN has a look in uh, with the playoff after a couple of years of the deal. So that's the other moving piece of this combined with to say nothing of. And I know... <laughs> What, what used to be Pac-12 fans and now Big Ten fans uh, will be waxing poetic about, uh, and they already were, but now Oregon's purpose is Big Ten fans being uh, the SEC continuing to only play eight conference games, uh, a conversation that Greg Sankey himself would very much like to have uh, extinguished uh, at this point over a year and a half ago, uh, maybe two and a half years ago. But they will get, I strongly suspect they're going to get to nine in time, but they're they're delaying in part to see what the impact of the expanded playoff looks like and what what does that look like and what what does what would further cannibalization do uh to at large team possibilities and the like and i'm not sure that they can necessarily have a perfect answer for that after a year or two but that's one of the other moving pieces of all this so all to say the preseason polls are out ducks are basically where they more or less where they were expected to be, to be quite honest i don't think if they were four or five behind a texas or an alabama that anybody really would have you know, quibbled that much, to be totally honest with you. Um, there's a 
there's a small gap in the AP poll between them and Texas. It's not enormous. If if somebody had Texas ahead of Oregon, I, I really couldn't possibly you know object to that level. But bottom line, I mean, they're a preseason top five. Whether you think they're two, three, four, or five is a matter of perspective. But yeah, they're every bit as good. They're expected to be every bit as good on paper entering the season as those with the most uh, green and yellow shaded glasses would believe. And those, again, across the country, you're getting a sampling of, yes, that, that people very much believe that this team uh, is every bit worth the billing uh, that they've been receiving so far. So that's where uh, the perception parts of things uh, come in at this point. Let's get to a little bit of reality now that we've had a chance to see, uh, albeit a limited portion of practice uh, for a couple of days, but we have seen some practices last week. Have seen a little bit by way of personnel, uh, particularly on the uh, offensive and defensive lines and certain pairings and the like, which is uh, kind of part and parcel to what we get to see at practice. Uh, and like I say, you know, yeah, there was the first scrimmage, which is always closed, and the second one will be as well. So, kind of going on a little bit of combination of what Dan Lanning has to say after it, which is uh, usually very little, uh, combined with uh, uh, photos and videos that managed to come out, including from within the program itself, that you're able to discern a little bit by way of uh, uh, further verification of what Lanning has had to say or expounding on what he's had to say and the like. So Yeah, or the latest episode of, uh, of Team Out West. That's, yeah, yeah, I'm that, sure that'll that's be, another I'm sure uh, that will be illuminating uh, here whenever that comes along. I'm sure that will be a, a full breakdown of any number of things uh, from, from camp as well. But bottom line being, uh, from what we've seen and gleaned uh, so far, uh, and, and from kind of just a little bit of conjecture that I've, that I've heard a little bit, Sounds like when it's ones on ones uh, that there is a lot of legitimate just back and forth that there is not you would not say that and it's not happening all the time for those who are not uh, deep in the weeds of these things when when starters are going against starters pretty much anywhere, especially in a camp setting where they're not scheming each other up and where they know each other's the defense knows the offense's cadence, the offense knows the defensive playbook pretty well here. And you're not really trying to quote unquote beat each other in that way. Uh, that from what I've been gathering and from what I've been gleaning uh, and from some of the things I've been hearing, that it's not as though one side is truly dominating the other. If anything, I've been hearing a little bit that the defense has been performing awfully good. That doesn't mean that there's uh, an outlandish number of turnovers or something. It means that, yeah, that quite simply that, the offense is having it is not having its way with the defense, uh, which for those who want to see the defense improve, you're going to love hearing that uh, for those who want to say that the offense should be was just one of the top offenses in the country last year and now expects even more with uh, with Gabriel and more weapons uh, than than what's the problem. Well, again, <laughs> you can you can always find something to be uh, uh, aggrieved about, I suppose. Yeah. But and folks can line. really get into the weeds with that stuff, too. Like offense is always behind defense and development and preseason. That's any any coach in the country would tell you that. And and on top of that, I think that if if I was looking at it like objectively as an Oregon fan, I would be more excited to to see the defense not only competing but winning or in some situations dominating. Like if if that was the case, then you know, I'd be happy because being a tenacious and consistent and physical and all of the superlatives defense is going to be the difference between them beating a team like an Ohio state or Michigan versus, you know, just being, being exciting with the football. It's, it's, it's what it always comes down to, but yeah, like pre preseason and, and camp and, and development, it always seems, and this is something that has, has been reiterated by coaches for years that the offense is just going to be behind the defense regardless too. And from, from what Glanning was saying about uh, the first, uh, first scrimmage that, uh, basically that the, uh, the offense ended up doing better on, uh, on third down, uh, that, uh, there was one turnover so sounded like reading between the lines sounded like it was an interception. Um, and that we were talking about, uh, quarterback decision-making and he alluded to one turnover. So sounds like it might've been in that way. Now it's unclear as to who threw that. That doesn't have to be anybody in particular. That could have been one of the walk-ons. Like you have no idea. Um, there's, there's no, no reason to make an assumption as to who that might have been. But bottom line, um, 
And uh, based off uh, some in-house photos, it certainly looks like uh, Jane Lamar scored a rushing touchdown uh, with what looked like at least part of uh, the number one offense uh, out there uh, based on, again, uh, in-house photos from, from Oregon itself. So uh, in terms of what could be gleaned and what was connected there, it sounded like there was not a ton by way of explosive plays. Uh, yeah, the defense may have had a turnover. Offense may have done better on third down. Uh, and like I say, at least this one rushing score because uh, you know, Jay Lamar is being hoisted up by uh, multiple starting offensive linemen. So uh, there you have it. But as to what that all may mean uh, in the week ahead, we'll start to see in this week of practice, uh, we'll start to be able to perhaps glean a little bit more by way of personnel groupings, uh, a little bit more if certain groups start to get pared down a little bit, particularly among the returners, uh, kickoff and, and punt returners, that is. Because even Joe Lurie, when we talked to him on Friday, basically said as much of, look, you know, you, you, you cast kind of a wide net at first um, and, and you want to see a bunch of guys get opportunities and um, a, a chance to field and a chance to um, showcase that, the, those skills in particular. And then, you know, you got to make decisions and pare it down a bit because let's call it what it is. You're not going to have eight or nine guys return kickoffs during the season. I mean, that's that's simply not happening. You know, you... <laughs> You have about one in, uh, on average over the year, I think it was 1.5 or 1.6 kickoff returns per game. So, and it's usually done by one player, maybe two. So, yeah, you're not going to have eight or nine guys in the course of the season. Yeah, the running backs and a couple of receivers and a couple of DBs, they have to do something in the first period of practice. So, okay, you let some of the fastest guys go and, and field kickoffs uh, for, for four or five minutes. Sure. But at a certain point, there's not going to be eight or nine of them. There just isn't. Now, historically, we've seen the running backs there before, even though <laughs> even though hardly any of them actually returned kickoffs during the year until uh, until the postseason when uh, when Bucky Irving managed to uh, get the opportunity to do that. And that's why I was asking Lorig about, is there anybody who's going to be off limits in some of those roles? Because, frankly, kickoffs is an area where this team needs to improve you know, on kickoff returns specifically. Uh, that that's an area they need to get better. Uh, when you have this much speed on a, on a team and this much depth in certain spots, uh, yeah, you, you know, you should be awfully, be awfully nice if you could get back to having a dynamic kick returner. Sounds like uh, there isn't necessarily going to be anybody, quote unquote, off limits. I'm sure, again, all within reason. Like, you know, Tess Johnson's going to be back there on punt returns again. He did fine. One, one particularly longer return could have skewed that number much, much higher than it was anyway. So you can't really extrapolate too much off a really limited sample there. Nothing was bad last year on punt returns. So that was okay. Could it be better? Sure. But again, one return can, can really throw that number off. Kickoffs, I just think it's an area that they can absolutely be better and they have more depth and they have more bodies. Uh, so we'll see exactly who may get a chance there. Could a Noah Whittington get legitimately get a shot there? Possibly. Possibly. Uh do I think one of the younger speed guys could could Rod Pleasant actually get a shot there? I mean, you can't if if it's supposedly if nobody's off limits and you're not going to rule it out. It'd be awfully hard to say no. And he probably is the fastest guy on the team, you know. And at the moment, he is vying to get on his way onto the two deep at corner, but he may not be. So unless you're intent on redshirting him. I, you know, I, I think he's at least worth a look. He's now he's among that very large group of guys working with the kickoff return right now. He's not, you know, the number one guy exactly, but we'll see. And I realize like we're talking about a play that ultimately happens, like I say, one and a half times a game on average. So let's not make yeah. more of it than it is. But like that's it's an area so that infrequent, you we, know, like it's... we do see it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, when it, and when they're dynamic at it. You know, it's, it, it can change the game. And yeah. that is one of Yeah, <laughs> you think back to like DeAnthony Thomas against Kansas State and that Fiesta Bowl. Like those are the memories that come up of, of the Oregon teams of old. So they, they have they have the speed and they have the weapons on this team to, you know, make that a more dynamic play uh, than it has been the last couple of years. We'll see ultimately who they turn to in that in that realm. Uh, otherwise, frankly, the you know some of the things that we got to look at uh, heading into this week, not just in terms of what gets pared down and the like, is um, one group in particular is the edge rushers. Uh, not just because they're younger, not just, you know, again, that the, the whole off-season long uh, bit that we could talk about of, you know, they got a lot, a lot of production to replace in the front seven, and the D-line got younger, but they brought in the two transfers, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really sophomore and freshman-laden edge group outside of Jordan Birch. 
Absolutely. All those things were already true. Uh, what's changed ever so slightly over the last week is that uh, Amari and Winston's been limited uh, exactly to what extent in, in the course and throughout practice, we don't know, but uh, we, we very clearly limited uh, in terms of, you know, pre, even pre-practice, we're able to make that out very, very, very clearly. And Ashton Porter wasn't out there uh, at the end of last week on either Wednesday or Friday. And, and one would discern that if you're not practicing multiple days during the week, you probably didn't take part in the scrimmage either. So, when you knock off two guys off the edge, uh, in particular two guys who are working uh, at times at the same position, uh, yeah, that becomes a thinner group. Uh, do they still have bodies? Do they still have guys who are you know higher on the depth chart? Absolutely. Uh, you know Mateo and Tatum in particular. But bottom line, when you're when you're putting off a scrimmage and you're trying to put two teams worth and go two and three deep on those two teams. When you knock two guys off, <laughs> it becomes a thinner group in a hurry. Uh, so yeah, thankfully they are, that's... they are built in such a way, like, you know, where the depth you're talking about with, with guys like Mateo being present and, and being able to fill those gaps, at least in, in the confines of practice. We, we don't necessarily know too, like you said, um, you know, the, the extent of the injury for Winston, um, it's a right leg, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, and- he's, uh, he's, he's basically just had a, a sleeve, uh, one of the, one of the many sleeves on, but, uh, it's clear that, that he's favoring the, the right leg. And, uh, again, you don't want to make more of it than it is. He's out there, he's practicing. It's just that he's with the guys who are limited and he's not going through all the, uh, early practice, uh, um, reps. Uh, that some of the other guys are, and that's as much as we know. Whereas Porter, he he just hasn't been there the last couple of days, so um, that's we don't know exactly what uh, the nature of that situation is either. But uh, it's easy to you know. There's, there's no point in even saying like what exactly it is. No, we don't know, but we do, we know he's not there. Uh, so that's more significant than uh, what Winston is dealing with. What appears to be a, a right leg issue. And we'll see. Like I say, a, 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 that is a group. That we'll be paying attention to uh, over the next week plus, and uh, and for that matter, same thing with the offensive line. Um, you know, again, we we have a, certainly a good feeling as to and a, and a good idea as to who the starting five will be and where that'll go and all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that could be rotating guys still and stuff. Yeah, but what I'm I'm interested to see this week heading into the beginning of next week is all right. Like when when do they shift to what was the personnel groups in spring? And even what we've seen early in camp of these split squad kind of deals to, you know, it's going to come a point where the ones are going to be going with the ones, period. You know, it's not going to be three starters with one group and two starters with the other group. And same thing on the defensive line. It's not going to be two starters with one group and two starters with the other group. And the linebacking core isn't going to have Boss on one side and Justin on the other. And no, like, I think you started to see that a little bit in the scrimmage. Uh, and I'm curious to see exactly at what point, perhaps this week, uh, we start to see more of that across the board, that the ones are with the ones, the twos are with the twos, the threes are with the three, et cetera, et cetera. And that they they have to start to, yes, make some personnel decisions uh, because the season is rapidly approaching. Uh, and not that you have to be... <laughs> Not to look past uh, number seven in the FCS Idaho, but you do have to sooner or later uh, fill out a depth chart, uh, fill out a plan and come up with this ideas for for personnel. And I have no doubt that uh, a very, very significant number of players uh, will be taking part and participating in uh, the season opener. I believe going back to last year's game uh, and one of the notes I took there, I think it was right around 80. I want to say it was approximately 80 uh, players took part. Uh, in last year's game with Portland State. So uh, read into that what you will in terms of uh, what could potentially <laughs> – what could potential, who could all potentially be playing in the four-game redshirt uh, rule era combined with the expanded playoff era. I think you're going to see a, uh, a very, very deep use of personnel uh, on, on August 31st. And that's fun, honestly. Like d- beyond the the team, like destroying its opponent, and you you see a lot of touchdowns and yada yada. I, I think that for like the the hardcores, the sickos am- among Oregon fans, like being able to see all of those guys uh, that you know really aren't going to see the field much, if at all, this year is is fun because you get little flashes of of what could be in the coming years. Hey, you know, 
you don't, you don't have to you don't have to say it's just among the sickos among the fan base They're, believe me go back a couple <laughs> of years ago and some of us who were tracking who who the traveling second long snapper was <laughs> so that when the day came that Carson Battles was no longer the starter who it would be and uh, believe you me we were taking note back in 21 that Luke Basso was indeed uh, the next guy and uh, the heir apparent. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it? There he uh, is. Yes, the, the yeah. starter all of last year and, and again this year. So, yes, there will be, I have no doubt, uh, many of the, the uh, scouting and the like for every position, including, uh, yes, special teams. It's, uh, we can joke a little bit, but but no, with the amount of depth that they have at certain positions, particularly at the skilled positions, uh, receiver and corner in particular, uh, I think a lot of freshmen will get an opportunity, uh, obviously, in that first game. But that said, it. The second game, like you mentioned, Ryan, goes uh, and ratchets up significantly. Uh, it might be, frankly, the most competitive of the three non-conference games, and not just of the non-conference. I think the Boise State game could be <laughs> – Boise might be a better team than than multiple members of the Big Ten who Oregon is playing this year. Yeah. Uh, they, are, they are a legitimate team. Uh, frankly, I, it would not shock me if Boise State – if the only loss they take is to Oregon, it would not shock me at all if, if Boise State goes 11 and 1 in the regular season and wins the Mountain West and is a 12 and 1 team at all. Yeah, um, seriously. So they, they could very, like, I want to say easily, exactly. Um, the Mountain West does have some, some decent teams in there, but they have every bit the level of talent and ability and the amount of guys returning, particularly on the defensive side, um, who, who were awfully productive uh, off a team who made it, you know, a mid-year coaching change and still won a conference title and all the rest where they're, they're a very, very live bullet. Uh, and, and not just in the playoff picture and the like, but yeah, they're, they're you don't want to overlook them. Like they're, no, no, they're I, significant. And, by, and I have to remind Oregon fans about not overlooking them. They've never beaten them. Um, so yeah, I realize it's only three matchups, but yeah, you, you don't want to overlook this Boise team. Like no. you can overlook <laughs> Purdue on a Friday night all you want. You may overlook Illinois all you want. You don't want to overlook Boise. Um, that that's not the team you want to be looking past because oh you know you have Oregon State the following week and the rivalry and even though that roster got got battered and beaten up by by the transfer portal it, yeah you, you don't don't overlook week two um, no that, you that should be and and I think that, that yeah you're right that could be something that that could be a little more competitive than maybe Oregon fans are expecting for for stretches of, of that game um, and, and maybe they they make the the early season ducks sweat a little bit just given the level of talent that's on that side for the Broncos um, and and I think it's the start of, of a nice little stretch for Oregon to to kind of work the kinks out and really like you know play against quote-unquote competitive football teams now the beaver game is is an interesting one for the fact that it will be more likely be competitive due to the rivalry maybe than the talent on the field but that's that's a different conversation entirely uh with, with that game but but that game the boise state game and that game on the road at ucla um preceding of course a, a game at home against a michigan state team that you feel better about than than maybe most of your your Big Ten opponents, but um, those three games in particular, I think, are nice little little tune ups and and work it out type games for a team that has really high expectations. Obviously, you know the expectation for them is to win those games and win them big. But um, within the confines, within within the little moments of those games, especially if Boise State is is making you sweat a little bit in the first or second quarter of that game, um, that that's good. That's all valuable because you don't want to just just come strolling into that Ohio State game and have sort of quote unquote saved your energy up for that um you, you want some some highly competitive moments and you know football is football but not every you know non-conference schedule and not every stretch of games leading into such a major matchup like the Ohio State one is going to lend itself to to that level of preparation yeah, and that's where, because of the, the scheduling changes and the things that were done, um, I know on paper it looks like, oh, it's, you know, I want to say disappointing is the wrong word, but it looks like, oh, well, Oregon's not playing a, a power conference uh, team in non-conference play this year, and they're not, and they're not. Uh, and, and don't begin to tell me that the Pac-12 is still a power. I mean, just, just stop it. Just stop it. Uh, it's not. But, but, Boise is every bit not just as good as, they are flat out better than, probably somewhere in the realm of more than 20 of the power four conference teams, at least, at least maybe more, frankly, 
So, yeah, there may not be one of the power four leagues, but truly, Boise is Boise State is legitimately better than probably in the realm of 20, if not more, power four conference teams. They just are. So I understand that, you know, by league affiliation, there's not that that power power four conference opponent because of all the moves and things that had to be done and moving Texas Tech a million years into the future in order to, to wedge the Oregon State game back in and move it up on the calendar, all, all, all those things. Yes, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, but for that matter, you know, Ohio State doesn't have a, a power conference, non-conference game either. Um, so, you know, their their early schedule isn't exactly loaded either. Uh, so that's why on paper these two teams look like they're going to be heading into a matchup each at 5-0 and oh because, frankly, Oregon has the two toughest games on paper. I mean, you could argue about whether Ohio State hosting Iowa, who's ranked, is a tougher matchup or not than Oregon hosting uh, Boise, who's just outside the top 25. We can quibble about differences there, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, that's those, those are the two toughest games, followed by Oregon going to UCLA, that either of those teams are playing before playing each other. It not, is being not, set uh, up, not great, uh, not great I- Iowa quarterback play rumblings based on, on what we've heard. But but uh, I mean, what what do you expect there? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, can't, it can't get worse. It can't get worse. It can't, uh, it can't but, possibly uh, be worse. <laughs> but bottom line, uh, again, we'll certainly get into the week to week and all that stuff in, in the weeks ahead. And um, we'll obviously do that all throughout the season. But insofar as uh, getting into, like I say, this first eh, basically week and a half of camp. From what we saw last week on the field and these preseason rankings, I think we've uh, certainly got a pretty good handle on things at the moment. Uh, and obviously much, yes, much still to be gleaned and learned uh, and, and to uh, look ahead to. And as we uh, wrap up this edition of the podcast uh, with that, what um, what are you hoping to discern? What are you hoping to hear about? Over the next week or so, Ryan, I say week or so because, yes, we'll probably pop in uh, early again next week with another edition of the podcast, maybe before uh, camp, quote unquote, officially wraps up. But whether it be over the next week or 10 days until basically the end of the the camp period of time and then they they shift gears to to game preparation for the opener. What are you looking to uh, glean what are you hoping to hear? Uh, what do you, uh, perhaps uh, uh, see a little bit from from practices, whatever the case may be. What is it that uh, uh, you've got left uh, by way of questions and things that you're trying to uh, discern here over the next week to ten days before, like I say, before things really shift into uh, to game preparation mode for uh, for the Ducks? Yeah, I think a lot of people have a lot of the same questions, right? Who's who's going to start? Where? where who's who's going to be um, at at certain positions? Who's healthy? You know, all the, all those sorts of things that swirl around a preseason camp. Um, I, I have been interested in and in, in my trips down to Eugene, fascinated by some of the individual personalities on the team and and the I think general connectedness that you see from this group and you've obviously been around you know multiple years of of Oregon football teams some connected more than others um it's 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 a product of finding the right personalities some some guys don't fit the mold it is what it is but I, I think that, you know, you look around, you, you listen to the guys talk to each other, um, you, you get a general feel for what these practices are like. Uh, and, and there is a sense of, of genuine connectedness already from the group. I think that's a, a foundation that was set in the spring um, and, and you know, all the different team building activities that, that whether the coaches you know, were the ones that, that started it or uh, the, the players did it on their own, for example, like, what has been talked about ad nauseum with Dylan Gabriel piling all the wide receivers into his van. Um, you know, th- there is a, a, a sense of that despite, you know, the, the expectation setting and, and the football jargon and the, the outside noise and the, the sometimes, you know, not terribly intuitive or, you know, informational conversations that, that you might have with coaches because they're trying to keep things close to the vest. Um, you do get a sense that, that this is a group that isn't just talented on the field, but um, 
you know, ha- has a, a level of, of connectedness that if they maintain it, you know, if they, they are able to, to keep the focus through the season and uh, execute on the field that, uh, that it, it could be something special. I'm, I'm excited to just talk to people and just to, to get to know the individual personalities on the team as the season goes along. There will be plenty of room for for you and me and and everybody else that covers this team um for the Oregonian to to get into the analysis and the conjecture and um week to week go through our power rankings and answer mailbag questions and everything else um but those personalities are are what are standing out to me and what I I hope to continue to to dive into in the coming weeks and uh with that like I say we'll certainly be uh be talking to more players and and coaches in the uh week and a half plus ahead as they wrap up camp and then obviously uh shift gears to the start of the 2024 season uh which uh yes believe it or not less than 3 weeks away rapidly approaching uh on the 31st with uh with Idaho and then yes uh, Boise State setting up in week 2 Oregon State the week after uh, and then the first of two buys, uh, a reminder to everybody that uh, in case for some reason you haven't looked at the schedule or, or seen that and reminded yourself, it is a two-buy season across the sport. And uh, Oregon got the short end of the stick by, from the Big Ten in terms of uh, uh, a buy followed by eight consecutive games. Uh, the only team in the league to get that. That's why I say they drew the short end of the stick because no other team in the league has that. Uh, and their second buy is the week before Washington. For that matter, Washington's second buy is also that week, uh, but their first buy week is uh, is at a different time, be that as it may. So uh, much to get into, obviously, like I say, on a week-to-week basis, but we will certainly uh, chat with you again next week, go over more of what we got by way of uh, this week at camp and hear from some more members of the coaching staff, some more players, uh, and where things look as the Ducks begin to prepare uh, and shift their gears towards uh, actual season preparation and the like. But with that, uh, I am James Creppy. Here's Ryan Clark, and we will see you next week here on the Ducks Confidential Podcast. Reminder, make sure to like, subscribe, five-star review, all those things, so that way more people can uh, find us, listen to us, and the like, uh, and it will pop into your feed accordingly. And we will see you next week.